All right, how many of you have ever been on a long trip? You go on a trip, right? You get ready to go, you got your stuff together, you get in the car, you're driving along, and then all of a sudden from behind your mom and dad, what do you hear? Right? We've all heard it. We've all been there. I actually, we actually, we went on that trip, right? My family and I went on the the trip last week, and my youngest daughter, God bless her. <laughs> there we were. I was picking up my oldest two daughters from the middle school. We were just getting ready to leave. We hadn't even left the area yet. We were in Ocano Falls, and she goes. How much longer? <laughs> oh, please, really. I don't think that's what we need to hear right now. That's not it at all. And you three. Where's the other? Oh, there he is. He's hiding back there. Is this the end? Is this the end of the journey? Does the day signify the end of where you're going? No, you're not there yet. You haven't arrived. It's not yet done. It's not quite over yet. Today we celebrate the Reformation. The Reformation started in 1517 on October 31st, All Hallows' Eve. Right? Luther went to the church, nailed to the 95 Theses to the door to start a discussion. And it started a Reformation. But is it... A reformed church? Or is it a reforming church? Is it something that happened and is over with? Or is it something that's still going on? Have we made it yet? Are we there yet? I don't know. October 31st, 1517. Martin Luther on the Wittenberg church door nailed the 95 Theses, and yes, I was told this morning that they are in the wrong language, which is correct. They are in the wrong language, but I hung them on the doors this morning on both ends and back here in English so that you could read them. Has any, did anyone read them? I got a couple of hands. Some people started to read them. I know some people started to read them, saying I thought it was a little cold, but he hung it up on the church doors in Latin because the common people could not have read it then. It was a, it was a document hung up there for a, a scholarly discussion. Luther wanted to have a discussion with the other professors at the, at the seminary, the school he was teaching at, and with the, with the hires up in the church. But Luther's students saw it. They read it. They knew what it was, and they knew it needed to be in the hands of the people. So they took it, and they translated it into German, and then they used the Internet of Luther's day. Right? I got a couple of chuckles. He posted it on Facebook <laughs> and sent a link out to it on Twitter, took a picture of it and put it up on Instagram, right? They took it down, translated it into German and used the printing press to, to get it out into the hands of the people. What was to be a scholarly, scholarly discussion became a movement that Luther absolutely did not intend to happen. Luther never wanted to leave the church. Luther wanted to stay a part of the one Roman Holy Catholic Church. He didn't want us to be worshiping this morning as Lutherans. But yet, his act of nailing those theses started a movement that caused things to happen and set things in motion. What did Luther want, really, in his Reformation. And if, if Luther hadn't done what he had did, would the Reformation still have happened? The answer is yes. Maybe not as quickly, maybe not in the same way, but yes, there were other Reformers working in and around in, in that same day when Luther was there. Calvin and Zwingli and a bunch of other people that did a lot of things to help progression of the, of the Protestant Reformation. But Luther was the impetus to get it started. He didn't want to leave the church, however. He didn't... He didn't care if the church didn't agree with him. All he was asking the church to do was allow him to preach what he knew the Bible was telling him he needed to preach. Just to allow him to preach what the gospel is telling us, right? 
Dr. Yego, a seminary professor at Southern Seminary, said the Lutherans struggled to maintain unity and asked only to be tolerated in preaching the pure word. And to that end, they presented their confession at Augsburg. From their perspective, at any rate, they did not leave the church. They were kicked out. Even in such a polemic document as the small clod articles, Luther expressed, expressed a willingness to accept bishops appointed by the Roman Antichrist for the sake of love and unity, if only the pure preaching of the gospel was permitted. Note that he did not demand that Rome adopt an evangelical doctrine, only that su such a doctrine be allowed. He never asked the church to change anything. He just asked the church to allow him to do what he knew was right. And that caused the Reformation. He read the Bible and saw what was going on was not what was supposed to be going on. Right? He read the Bible and saw that these papal indulgences that they were selling was not what needed to be done. He read passages like we read this morning in Romans where it says that there's nothing that we can do that it's the fact that Jesus Christ died for each and every one of us, that we're saved by grace. It's not our own doing. And beyond that, anything else doesn't matter. And that's what he wanted to be able to preach. But the church didn't want it to happen. Luther summarized this, his thoughts in the commentary on Galatians. Consequently, those who in order to become good flee the company of such people are doing nothing else but becoming the worst of all. And yet they do not believe this because for the sake of love they are fleeing the true duty of love. And for the sake of salvation they are fleeing what is the epitome of salvation. For the church was always best when it was living amongst the worst people. For in bearing their burdens and love shone with a wonderful sheen. We're not supposed to pull away from people in the world. We're supposed to be out there in the midst of them. Not in our own little monastic orders. Not in our own little cloistered buildings. Not sitting in here in the confines of these walls, safe and protected from everything out there that could draw us away from God. But we're supposed to be out there in the world. And that's what Luther wanted us to be. And that's what Christ calls us to do. After all, Moses didn't abandon the people in the wilderness, the Israelites, when they made the golden calf, did he? And the prophets didn't abandon the Israelites after they beat them and stoned them and killed them. They just kept going back over and over again. And God doesn't abandon us because of the things that we do to Him. But He tells us in the Old Testament reading this morning in Jeremiah that there will be a new covenant, right? He says there will be a new covenant. This is the only time in the Old Testament where it talks about a new covenant. The new covenant. And it talks about God writing these things on our hearts, right? And where is our heart? And what do you think of when you hear the word heart? I thought I heard it. What? Soul? Love. Love, right? It's emotion. It's pure emotion when we talk about the heart, right? Right? Yes? No? Maybe? The biblical understanding of heart, though, is the center of human intellect and will and reason. It's all up here when they're talking about, I will write it on their hearts. It's will and thought and reason in the Bible. Under the Old Covenant, the Ten Commandments were written on stone tablets so that everybody could see them and everybody would know what they were to say. But in this New Covenant, God is going to write all of His commandments and all of the things that we need to know already into us so that we will know them and we won't have to teach each other anymore. So my question then is, why do we have Sunday school? Did you hear the kid? Did you hear that? I don't know. <laughs> If God has written all of the things that we need to know onto our hearts and our minds and we know them and we don't have to teach anybody anymore, why do we still have to go to classes and learn this stuff? Why? Because why? Are we there yet? No. We still need to learn it. We still need to get it out. We still need to be able to understand it in a way so that we can help the people out there hear it and learn it and know it so that they will come and have it written upon their hearts. We are still on our way. We haven't actually made it to where we're going yet. So no, we're not there yet. And Jesus tells the disciples, the Jewish people that had believed in Him, if you continue in My Word, then you are truly My disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. 
And they said, what do you mean, free? They have really short memories, don't they? Anybody, can anybody tell me what happened to Moses early on in the Bible? Genesis? I should ask one of you three. Oh, Robbie's got his hand up. What is it, Robbie? What? They got lost, but where did they, before they got lost, what happened? Where were they before they got lost? In Egypt. And what were they in Egypt? Somebody over here said it. Slaves. They were slaves. They were in bondage. They were prisoners. They had to do what the Egyptians told them to do. And here they're telling Jesus, what do you mean to tell us that we're going to be free? We've never been slave to anybody. Um, hello? Did you forget the most recent past here? It's not that long ago. We've all been slaves to something. We're all held slave to something. It doesn't say in Jesus' sayings, when he says the truth will set you free, it doesn't say morality will set you free or being religious will set you free. Coming to church is not going to set you free. Only if you believe in what Jesus has told you and trust in the promises that he's given you are you going to be made free. Being in this building does not get you squat. Coming to worship is not what it's about. If you come to worship and you don't believe the promises that are spoken and you don't understand what's being said, then we're not really connecting and we're not getting it. It's all about the relationship that we have with God. David Foster, Was David Foster Wallace said, The truth will set you free, but, until it's fin but not until it's finished with you. Right? Jesus is going to make you free, but not until He's done making you into what He needs to make you into. Right? It's a process. It's a journey. It's something that we walk on and go through. Facing the truth about ourselves is the most freeing thing that we can do, but we don't always have the guts to do it. Unless we know that we're going to be loved unconditionally. Luther says it was grace that brought the prodigal son home. Otherwise, he would have rather died than to come home. The prodigal son, the son that left his father, telling his father before he left that he was dead. Give me what's mine because you're dead to me. He went away and spent it all and came back home because he knew there was love. Regardless of what he had done, he knew that his father would love him and accept him and bring him back into the family. Even though he wanted to be a slave, he still knew that he was going to be accepted back. The truth may set us free, but it takes a lot of grace to face that ugly truth. And Luther tells us, as Jesus said, we are free, yet we are still slaves. We are perfectly free, Lord of all, subject to none. And as a child of God, we are perfectly dutiful servant to all, subject to all. We are freed in the fact that we are to serve each and every other person around us. Because Luther told us, that it's not anything that we do that sets us free. It's the fact that Christ loves us and gives us His grace and His mercy and pulls us to Him that sets us free to serve each and every other person. He set us free so that we may be His hands and feet in this place. He set us free so that we can be His body and go and do the things that He is not able to do here now because He's asked us to go and do it. And that's what this journey is. And that's what these three young gentlemen are going to come up here this morning. And they're going to affirm what happened to them when they were babies and they were brought to this font. And the promise was laid upon them and they were named and claimed by God as children of the Most High, brothers with Jesus Christ, to go out into this world to do what Jesus has called them to do, to love each and every other person in this place and each and every other person out there, regardless of who they are or what they've done. Because that's what Christ has called us to do. And we don't do it on our own because it's only God who does it working through us. Luther said about the third article of the Apostles' Creed. Ooh, should I make you say the Apostles' Creed? Maybe later. Luther said about the third article of the Apostles' Creed, I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to Him, but the Holy Spirit has called me by the Gospel, enlightened me with His gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. I cannot by my own reason, power, or strength come to believe in God except for the fact that the Holy Spirit is already working in me. See, it is God that is working in us, that sets us free and allows us to be His children. 
It's the the Holy Spirit working in us that sets us free and allows us to serve each and every person around us. So we're not there yet. And Luther told us, and we already most understand, that we cannot make it on our own, that we need God. A God who knows us, even our insecure attempts to justify ourselves through our own works. God knows us that we try to make ourselves right to Him by the things that we do by our works, by our accomplishments, by our wealth, by our status. God knows us sometimes, all the time, even better than we know ourselves. But even though God knows us better than you know yourself, God still loves you. God knows who you are, and He still loves you the way that you are. He loves you. Accepting you and loving the insecure, wayward people that we are. Not the person that we've tried to be, not the person that we've promised to be, not the person that we want to be, but the person that we are. Because Christ has set each and every one of us free. And in that freedom, God loves us. He gives us His unconditional love and His unconditional acceptance all the time. Because faith is a journey. Something that each and every one of us are on. Something that each and every one of us can relive this morning in the steps that these three young men make living our lives in a way that we're learning who we are in God and living out a life of service to others. Because each and every day we're invited to this table. We're invited to a life where we get to share Christ and spread His redeeming love and grace and mercy with everybody. And this gift of grace and love both puts to death our attempts to justify ourselves and raises us to a new life as we discover not only that we deserve love and respect, but have already been given it by the man and the creator of the cosmos. The creator of all the world loves you unconditionally and has raised you up to be a part of his plan and a part of his mission. So continue on your pilgrimage of faith knowing that we're not there yet, but that God is going to walk with us and that he is going to guide our feet and that if we can just trust in everything that he's already told us, that He's never going to leave us or forsake us, and He's going to be our shade and our shelter and guide us along our lives to be a beacon of hope in a world that so much needs to see Him. Amen.